tonight on CBC Vancouver News. I mean, I placed the ad because I need a family doctor. The desperate lengths to find a family doctor. Why one man is willing to pay five grand for help. In the past month, I've contacted 65 plus places. I've only ever received responses from a few. A week to go and nowhere to live. The impossible task of finding housing to attend university. And I'm moved to tears. And a new crisis line solely for mental health emergencies. The BCMP who pushed to make it happen. This is CBC Vancouver News. for joining us. I'm Anita Bath. We begin tonight with the desperation people are feeling in the search for a family doctor. A Vancouver man has taken out a newspaper ad offering $5,000 to help him secure a doctor. As Karen Larson tells us, the father of three has a medical condition and says going without steady care is risking his health. I mean, I place the ad because I need a family doctor. It's that simple for Gary Schuster, who suffers from a metabolic disorder so rare, he carries around these information cards about the disease should he fall ill. Emergency room doctors typically have no or little experience with fatty acid oxidation disorders. His condition, CPT2 deficiency, needs consistent monitoring, something that disappeared when his family doctor retired earlier this month. Efforts to find a new doctor have so far led to long wait lists. So he placed this ad offering $5,000 to anyone who can help him find a suitable family doctor near his home in downtown Vancouver. Need someone who's capable of tracking the disease, understanding it. Um, you know, typically, if I have to see a doctor I'm not familiar with, uh, the first 10 minutes of that session is explaining what the disease is. An estimated 1 million British Columbians are without a family doctor. Last week, the province announced $118 million in stopgap funding to support the sector, while a new fee structure is negotiated with physicians. But that won't help Schuster find the help he needs now. This is truly sad, but again, indicative of how bad the healthcare crisis is on the ground. I hope one of my colleagues can, and I'm sure they will, someone will try to make room for him. Nobody should ever have to put an ad in the paper. As a dual Canadian U.S. citizen, Schuster's considered buying private health insurance across the border and finding a doctor in Washington state. We know the battle ahead will be long. But he believes in public health care even fought for it while living in California before moving to Vancouver after Donald Trump became president. I actively worked on um, the Obama campaign in 08 uh, precisely because he was promising to deliver a Canadian-like system. So it's not lost on Schuster how his $5,000 incentive undermines the very system he believes in. I think it's terrible that I'm able to do that and others can't. It's unfair, it's not how the system was supposed to be built, but at the same time, I have young kids, and if something were to happen to me, it would really be a disaster for them. As of Wednesday afternoon, two people who don't want payment had responded to the ad. Karen Larson, CBC News, Vancouver. And for those who do have consistent medical care, virtual visits have exploded since the onset of the pandemic. Health experts say it's only going to become more prevalent in the years ahead. And our John Hernandez is looking at why that could be key to alleviating pressure on an overburdened health care system. It was like I was on a ship. And when I looked around, my, my crewmates were all called death. It was news Victoria's Matt Varley never wanted to hear. He was diagnosed with lung cancer in December 2020. I decided to jump that ship and get on a ship of support. The husband and father faced chemotherapy head on. During his treatment, he was offered an at-home health monitoring kit, which measured his vitals and were reported to nurses remotely. There was a tablet. They gave me a little contraption that I'd stick on the end of my finger and it would tell the, my pulse and my oxygen level. Varley is one of about 20,000 British Columbians who have received remote health monitoring over the past two years, compared to just a few hundred annually pre-pandemic. He says it gave him a sense of agency and comfort. Being given a bit of information about 
your vitals. I did think that, hey, I'm I'm having a look and I'm seeing that my health is as good as it can be. The pandemic-induced movement towards digital health seemingly here to stay. <laughs> On Monday, ground broke for a new hub in Vancouver that will develop more remote care technology, part of a global industry that's expected to grow to more than $150 billion by 2027. The next phase that I think now the world gets and is ready for is home. And while the technology can help people in remote areas, reduce travel, and ultimately open up hospital beds, health experts say it should be viewed as a supplement to in-person care, not a replacement. We want to then take the best of what we've learned in the past few years and merge it with what we were doing before. The remote monitoring, I, I do believe, alleviated a lot of the taxing requirements of our medical system. A treatment option that might not work for everyone, but can be just what the doctor ordered for the right patient. John Hernandez, CBC News, Vancouver. Booster doses will be a big part of the strategy to combat COVID-19 this fall and winter. And now CBC News has learned Health Canada will approve a new shot tomorrow. It will specifically target the Omicron variant. Both Pfizer, BioNTech and Moderna have filed applications for new bivalent vaccines. One of those will be approved tomorrow. Moderna has already agreed to supply Canada with 12 million doses of its shot. Today, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration authorized booster doses from both companies in the U.S., with shots expected to be available within days. Turning now to another health care crisis in this province, B.C. is on track to hit a terrible milestone in the fight against toxic drugs. More people are projected to die in 2022 from a poisoned drug supply. At least 1,095 people have died this year up until the end of June. That's the most in the first six months of any year since the health crisis was declared in 2016. More than three quarters of people who died this year were men, with a high majority of them being between 30 and 59 years old. No part of B.C. is untouched. And today on International Day for Overdose Awareness, our Joel Ballard is looking at the desperate pleas for something to change. He's got this, like, mischief smirk that he's got there going. <laughs> it's been four years since Shireen Schuster's son Jordan died from an overdose. He was 25. Every day I think of Jordan, every hour, every minute I think of my son. On the road to recovery, Jordan was set to begin a new job as an electrician at YVR. Then two of his friends from rehab died. He went out and what he thought he was purchasing was heroin. And had my son smoked heroin, that day he'd be alive. His um, autopsy report it was 100% pure fentanyl, so he didn't have a chance. Jordan's story is all too common. Since the toxic drug overdose crisis was declared in 2016, more than 10,000 people have died. And it all could have been so prevented, you know? I mean, just we need safe supply. Of course, I don't want my son smoking heroin, but at least if he had smoked heroin that day, we would have gone back into recovery, get him the help that he needs. Schuster's pain and frustration shared by many. Family members and friends who have lost loved ones. That loss highlighted on Overdose Awareness Day. Yeah, one more. Yeah, one more. In Victoria, members of Schuster's group Mum Stop the Harm gathered, marching for change. Our government, which has the power to approve widespread, low barrier, safe supply, but does not do it. What does that mean? What does that mean for our children who have died, our loved ones who have died? And outside of St. Paul's Hospital in downtown Vancouver, an open house with information and education. We wanted to give it into the muscle, so this can be the deltoid here or a large muscle on the leg. An opportunity to learn to save a life. You want to go 90 degrees, just straight in. And you'll hear a click and then the needle is extracted back. This year, the province is on track to set a grim record with the most lives lost due to the toxic drug crisis. In the first six months of 2022, nearly 1,100 people died. It's not something that just affects a certain group of people. Um, you know, everybody, I think, knows someone that, or, or knows someone that knows someone who is struggling with a substance use issue. Back at her home, Schuster wears a necklace with her son's fingerprint. The locket carries Jordan's ashes. 
a reminder of why she's fighting for change, not just on Overdose Awareness Day, but every day. Our goal is just to raise awareness, stop the stigma, and save lives. Joel Ballard, CBC News, Vancouver. Well, they're stressed tonight as university students prepare to return to campus for the fall semester. It's supposed to be an exciting time, but for many, it's turned into a nightmare as they're still left scrambling to find a place to live. And as Susanna De Silva tells us, at least one university has had to tell some students to delay their studies. In the past month, I've contacted 65 plus places. I've only ever received responses from a few. And most of the responses weren't actually options. $1,400 a month, and I thought it was like a shared <laughs> bill until I contacted to confirm that price with the, uh, with the seller. And he's like, yeah, it's $1,400 a single person. A price this UBC grad student who just arrived from India working and saving to cover her tuition can't afford. It's just been very anxiety inducing and stressful. She, like many students, even placed a dating like post with her picture, basic details and qualities on Facebook housing groups, hoping a landlord off campus would be a match. UBC has a 5,000 person wait list for on-campus housing and the shortage is not just in extreme housing markets like Vancouver and Toronto. We were kind of like eager to uh, find a uh, plan B. The University of Moncton had to put a call out trying to help 120 students with nowhere to go. We had already 37 um, rooms that were available after that launch that we did. Uh, so the community has responded. At the University of PEI, a more extreme message. If they haven't found a place to live, we are saying, um, please don't come, please defer, come in the winter, come next fall. Experts say with students taking online classes from home during the pandemic, many landlords were forced to look for other kinds of tenants, while other properties were sold to take advantage of high real estate prices. So we've got uh, an increased number of students coming in with a decreased amount of traditional student housing available. And the two of them, you know, put together to cause this crisis that's happening now. This website connects students and landlords. Some schools are offering to cover the fee landlords pay to post, while new housing developments are in the works at others. UBC says it already has more housing than any other school. Chavi Mahera finally found an affordable place with roommates she has met. It's definitely one less thing on my plate. But for many others, with days to go, it's still a worry. Susanna the Silva, CBC News, Vancouver. Now to backlash over a new federal luxury tax set to take effect tomorrow, adding to the cost of high-end boats, cars and planes. The government says the goal is for the wealthiest to pay a fair share. But as Peter Cowan shows us, Canadians who build and sell boats say they are the ones unfairly paying the price. This thing is built for the family for the whole weekend. This top-of-the-line fishing boat comes with a top-of-the-line price, about $500,000 fully loaded, plus tax. And starting this week, a new luxury tax will add up to 10% to that price. We've had a couple of cancellations already on our big boats. It's not just the tax. Inflation has driven up the price of raw materials and labour. We've experienced about a 30% increase across the board in price increases. It's, it's becoming a, a pricey endeavour going out in the ocean, having some fun with your family. But if you can afford a boat like this, the federal finance minister says you can afford to contribute more. People who are doing really, really well should feel comfortable supporting everybody else. It's not just boats. New planes and cars worth more than $100,000 are also facing the new tax. It's expected to bring in between $140 to $165 million. The scheme of the overall finances of the government of Canada, $163 million, doesn't even qualify as rounding error. Clearly. This former federal finance official says the tax doesn't make sense, especially when it leaves out other luxuries like expensive jewels, big RVs or pricey cottages. He says if the government wants the rich to pay more, they can increase the income tax. I don't know what the logic of is of a luxury tax that comes from a populist notion to somehow ding the wealthy, but we already do that. Uh, we have a progressive income tax system. Mark Delaney says he's worried his workers will be the real ones to pay for this tax if the orders dry up and he has to lay people off. There's going to be some, some, uh, some pain here to go through. 
The United States introduced a similar luxury tax in 1991. Less than two years later, it was scrapped after it cost tens of thousands of jobs. The boating industry in this country is hoping the government learns the lesson there and scraps the tax here. Peter Cowan, CBC News, Ottawa. Well, the South Surrey by-election is less than two weeks away and advance voting begins tomorrow. The BC Liberals are hoping to hang on to the seat left vacant after MLA Stephanie Cadieu resigned in April. As Mira Baines tells us, the political contest is shaping up to be a low-key test of how the province's political parties are faring. And then they go hang on for a bit. BC Liberals are gearing up to get their supporters out for the Surrey South by-election. The Liberal star candidate is Eleanor Sturko, well-known as a former Surrey RCMP media spokesperson, now on leave. This is a big tent party. Former B.C. Liberal MLA Stephanie Cadieu won the last election for Surrey South with almost 1,200 more votes than the NDP candidate who's running again. Cadieu has resigned to join the federal government as Canada's first chief accessibility officer. But timing is not on the Liberal side. The September 10th by-election is at the end of the first week of school and on the same day the federal Conservative Party will announce its new leader. So it's almost like the NDP didn't want anyone to notice that this race was happening. Perhaps their voters would come out and Liberal voters wouldn't know. Health care and the future of the Massey Tunnel are top of mind in this riding. The NDP's Pauline Greaves has been pushing for a second hospital near Kwantlen Polytechnic University at a cost of $1.7 billion with 168 beds. Greaves says land previously designated was sold off by a Liberal government. For too long? The people of Surrey and Cloverdale have been waiting for a second hospital. Sturco says the planned hospital should be located near the Langley Surrey SkyTrain connection and offer more. You know, we would like to see a full service hospital. So that means a maternity ward, an ICU, um, more beds than 168. 168 beds, not enough. In a very tight race, other parties could also play a role in deciding the winner. SFU student Simran Sarai is running for the Greens. Harman Bungu, who owns a trucking business, is running for the BC Conservatives and is being endorsed by MLA John Rustad, who was ousted from the BC Liberal Caucus for social media tweets about climate science. Jason Bax is running for the Libertarian Party. If the BC Liberals lose the seat, it could be a sign of trouble for the party's new leader, Kevin Falcon. But a win could help the party build momentum as the province inches closer to a general election in 2024. Mira Baines, CBC News, Vancouver. And the race to lead Canada's Green Party is picking up steam. This time, the format is a little different. Six candidates have stepped forward with two as independents and four others who want to run as part of two-person teams. That includes former party leader Elizabeth May, who is joined with human rights investigator Jonathan Paidno. Well, it's about the two of us, Elizabeth and I, offering an opportunity to the party to use our complementary expertise to bring this party forward, to rebuild the party. The party will announce who makes it through the first round on October 14th. The winner will be announced on November 19th. Well, a crackdown on parking at Cultus Lake is coming this weekend. The province, the RCMP and the Fraser Valley Regional District have partnered up on a towing trial. They'll remove any vehicles parked along the Columbia Valley Highway. All summer, there's been too many cars parked illegally, and officials say it's a hazard to drivers, pedestrians, and emergency vehicles. So this weekend, they're warning anyone heading to that lake in Chilliwack that tow trucks will be out in full force. Well, after more than two years off the tracks, the Amtrak passenger train service between Vancouver and Seattle is returning on the 26th of September. The first train to Vancouver will depart Seattle at 7.45 a.m. It will return at 5.45 p.m. Amtrak says the single round trip will be offered daily and there is a possibility of a second daily trip that could be added in the future depending on staffing and equipment. After a month and a half since a parkade in East Vancouver collapsed, WorkSafe will soon reopen the Central Valley Greenway bike path adjacent to the disaster site. Um, I'm... I'm very glad to have heard back from WorkSafe BC that they uh, were wrapping up and have wrapped up their investigation, and so the route will reopen very soon. Boyle says there is no more concern about debris falling on the Greenway. She tweeted today the Greenway will reopen imminently, but she's still working to confirm an exact date. 
cyclists are welcoming the reopening, but say more needs to be done to prioritize active transportation. And I'm relieved that it didn't take, you know, an actual accident to happen for, for it to reopen, which is really what I was afraid of. I would really like to know what the plan is going forward to keep something like this from happening. There's still no detour signage. The route is still closed. There's no explanation of what happened. Like, is this just going to happen again? Councillor Boyle says she will be prompting the city for better strategies on ensuring safe detours for pedestrian and cyclists after emergency closures. Firefighters scrambled in Kamloops today after a grass fire broke out inside city limits. The temperature hit a scorching 38 degrees when the blaze broke out near Aberdeen Mall. The fire bordered Hillside Drive and drew a lot of onlookers while Kamloops Fire worked to knock out the flames. Cars were rerouted in the area as they got it under control and crews are still on scene. Yeah, it sure has been, as you just told me a couple minutes ago, a very dry August, hasn't mm -hmm. it, Johanna? Yes, Anita, still adding up the numbers. We'll wait for today's official data to come in, but this could be one of the driest August on record for huge swaths of southern BC. Metro Vancouver could be coming in at one of its driest and certainly seeing those dry conditions these past few weeks in the interior, helping to spark those extreme fire conditions. Take a look at the fire danger rating across the country, still looking at pockets of high to extreme in the south and northeast. This is also lining up where we're expected to see some of our driest August numbers come in. Uh, Vancouver Island and parts of the interior also under level three drought. So things have switched quickly and it is late in the season uh, to be seeing temperatures as high. We still have heat warnings in place for the Sunshine Coast, East Vancouver Island, Fraser Canyon, where we broke daily temperature records once again today. West Van, Pemberton, Vancouver, Port Alberni was the hot spot across the country most of the day. One thing I am watching live right now is lightning. A little bit of a system sneaking up from the south, getting through our high pressure ridge. And we are seeing active lightning strikes in our high risk fire region. So we'll keep an eye on that, Anita. We may see new fire starts over the next couple of days, but generally hot and dry, I'll break down coming up. All right, we'll talk to you soon, Joe. Thanks. You're welcome. Turning now to our coverage of the municipal elections happening this fall. The races are already heating up and you may be seeing plenty of social media ads in your feeds. But how many of the pointed ads are actually true? Justin McElroy is looking at the claims being made about road taxes. Have you seen this ad? Kenny Stores new tax is what he's called road pricing. Yes, Kenny wants to tax you for simply driving into downtown. This is the claim by a better city party led by Ken Sim, who finished runner up to Stewart last election. And his claim is pretty straightforward. If reelected, Kennedy Stewart is 100% committed to putting in a new vehicle tax in entering what is known as the Metro core. They claim the city will change five to $30 for every trip, including ambulances. And they've claimed the mayor is crystal clear about this. Driving to your favorite restaurant downtown? Tax. Driving to go visit a loved one at St. Paul's or Vancouver General Hospital? Tax. It all sounds very dramatic, and it comes from a party that has a clear chance of forming government. But is it actually true? Here is where the claim comes from. On November 17th, 2020, Council passed the next step in its Climate Emergency Action Plan. One of those steps was to ask staff to study the concept of a charge for entering the core of the city, with a vote happening years from now on whether to actually make it happen or not. In BC, we call the concept mobility pricing. Now, council voted 6-5 in favor of doing the study, including ABC councillor Rebecca Bly, who passed an amendment clarifying that a lot of studying and working with other cities was required. This is where major cities are going across the world, and, and it is because we have to work together, and I'm excited to see what staff bring back. And that is where we're at. There's no proposed price point, no proposed way it would work, just studies. Studies and the fact that the province told CBC News that they wouldn't support it. 
and the mayor himself has not given support. Well, I mean, that's not on the agenda right now. It's, so. com it's coming in a few months' time based on staff reports. <laughs> well, we'll see. You know, I mean, I know that Vancouver can't do mobility pricing on its own. That's been pretty clear. Well, at this point, what I've been told is that there's no legal way for us to go it alone and put mobility pricing. But staff were asked to study it by a majority of council. So they have continued to study it. And if history is any indication, they'll study it until they're told not to study it anymore. Here is a chart. It shows the number of times in the last decade there's been an article in a major BC newspaper with the phrase mobility pricing. And here is the number of times there's been an actual vote on making it happen. It's been a repetitive work project for bureaucrats over the last decade, and you can certainly critique local government for that. But it's never come up for a vote because politicians have never felt there's enough support. Still, this is election season. In short, it's a tax on everything. This week, the mayor said he didn't support it, and ABC candidates said, essentially, that they didn't believe him. They might continue their campaign claiming what the mayor would do if re-elected. But at this point, mobility pricing to Vancouver seems to be moving about the same speed as a car moves towards Vancouver itself, at least on the North Shore during rush hour. Think 911, but for suicide prevention and mental health crisis. 988 will be the new emergency hotline across all of Canada. After the break, a closer look at what the change means. Thanks for watching our commercial free live stream. Nova Scotia recently hosted some of the world's best double bit axe throwers with 10 countries vying for the world championship. Colleen Jones was there. Down in beautiful Barrington, it's not lobsters and lighthouses I'm talking about. Rather, it's Ulza. The very best in the world from 10 countries are here competing for the world title. Andreas Rettig is from Germany. With plenty of axe tattoos and his double bit axe at the ready, he's waiting to go throw. I'll get at home so that we can also do practicing after work if we are a little bit angry and take the axe, do some throws and come down. And Heath Dawson's cheering on the Irish. For every bullseye, he blows the Viking horn. That's Ryan McIntyre on the mic announcing the players. He runs the Nova Lumberjack Society and he helped get this event here. In terms of the sport and the legacy something like this leaves, it, it allows people to see what's possible. They can have an event of this size, they can have this many throwers, you can bring people from all over the world. So Now to get this hockey rink converted into lumberjack heaven, it required some carpentry transformation. We've got a really strong structure here made out of 4x4 four four posts that people are really enjoying throwing on and I think it's got great sound. He says the targets are kept here in a spa bath to keep the moisture level just perfect. And then we soak them again and dry them out and now we just want them perfect amount of perfect amount of moisture so that the target, the axes stick in them. Six inches from tip to tip. This of course being the double bit axe championship requires a certain axe. Double bit axes traditionally in lumberjack uh, uh, trades they would use one side for felling the other side for chopping. Now what that made is a really balanced axe with a straight handle so it would fly through the air nice and true. It's not just about the competition outside vendors are selling. Andrea Nickerson started producing these t-shirts when she heard the worlds were happening. And I can't keep them on the rack. They're selling fast. <laughs> Who doesn't want a I'm sexy and I throw it t-shirt? The world champs, by the way, will be declared on Sunday. Colleen Jones, CBC News, Barrington.
feel like you've always known the emergency number to call if there's a fire, someone is hurt, or you need to reach police. It's 911, of course, but soon Canada will have a dedicated three-digit mental health and suicide hotline. The number is 988, and it will debut next year. I'm thankful that we, uh, for everybody that brought their voice forward to get this done, it's so needed. Todd Doherty, the MP for Caribou Prince George, pushed for this coordinated national number, which people will be able to call and text. Parliamentarians voted unanimously in favour back in December of 2020 as demand rose during the pandemic. It's finally been approved by the telecom regulator, the CRTC. So I'm sitting in uh, the Canadian Tire parking lot in Prince George, and I just got word that... The CRTC is going to adopt our push to implement 988, um, bringing 988 to Canada, giving Canada a simple three-digit suicide uh, hotline. And I'm moved to tears. Doherty was just 14 when his best friend died by suicide. The U.S. adopted 988 as a mental health hotline back in July. It will launch here in November of 2023. A huge change for mental health care in this country, but I want to help us get a better picture of how it's going to work. Stacey Ashen joins us live now and is with the BC Crisis Centre. She also works as a suicide intervention counsellor. Thanks for being with us, Stacey. No problem. Hello. You know, we already have crisis lines at the moment, including one by your organization. So what is the big difference in having this new shortened number 988? Mm -hmm. So 988 is a really easy number to remember. And so when you're in crisis and you want to think about where you want to call, it just makes it really easy to call that single number. Uh, and that number routes through to crisis centers all across uh, Canada. That's where it will go. So it can be routed to a local crisis center that can take those calls and connect you to the services you need. And so if someone is in an emergency, will the person on the other end of the line um, be able to help immediately, you know, talk them down or talk to them about what they're going through? That's the goal. The goal, like 988 is the front door. Um, and once you open the front door, we need to be available to, to take the call. 988 is really a promise that we will be there when you call. Now, answering that promise means making sure that all of the crisis centers across Canada have the capacity to take those calls. And those are the things that we're talking to the federal and provincial government to make sure that that capacity gets put in place. What happens now when someone calls 911 and they're dealing with a mental health crisis? Often 911 calls uh, will either go through to BC Ambulance if somebody asks for ambulance or if it's a per person who's concerned about someone else, it'll go through to police. But what that means is that you're sending out often people to, uh, to situations where we could have handled it over the phone. Uh, and when we're handling things over the phone, we're really working on keeping that person in control of their lives, handling the overwhelm that the crisis is causing, and then getting them into plans that work for them. And, and very often, 98% of the time, we're able to do all of that over the phone. You know, this is obviously good news today, and we saw the emotion um, that's coming from the MP that really pushed for this from Prince George. But how frustrating is it that this kind of support takes so long to approve and get going? We, it took so long to get here, and now it's going to take more than a year to actually get it up and running. Mm -hmm. Well, the good news is, is that we already do have crisis and suicide prevention lines across the country. So the, the help is there. The hard part is finding that number. So being able to change to 988 is a really, really helpful thing. The help, though, it is available. And so you know, we want to make sure that people are calling in BC, it would be 1-800-SUICIDE would be the line to call, or 310-6789 to reach mental health crisis care. Of course, it's just easier if there's one line to, to, to remember. Stacey Ashton is the executive director of the BC Crisis Centre and works as a suicide intervention counsellor. Thanks for being here. You're welcome.
Now, as Stacy mentioned, until the 988 number does come into effect, you can still reach the BC Crisis Centre 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You can call 1-800-784-2433. That is also 1-800-SUICIDE. They offer help in more than 140 languages. Canada's economy is booming, with the GDP jumping again in the second quarter. Why, there are so many signs of stormy economic weather ahead. It's coming up. was her last trip home. As the plane touched down just outside London, mourners sang hymns in St. Paul's Cathedral, where she was married. Coffin was draped in the royal standard. Prince Charles, the man she had married and divorced, had accompanied her on this last trip along with her sisters. Diana had been a revolutionary member of the British monarchy. She had shaken its foundations, but she had also possessed the power to touch people, a power seemingly magnified by her sudden tragic death. In spontaneous pilgrimages, Britons trooped to Kensington Palace, where she had lived, and to Buckingham Palace, to leave flowers, to leave messages, to leave teddy bears, shedding their reserve and their tears as they talked of a woman many felt they had known personally. She is everything beautiful in a person. We have lost her and nobody can replace her, but nobody. That emotion was echoed in the words of the British Prime Minister, Tony Blair. We are today a nation in Britain in a state of shock. You, press that killed her. You're the scum. Yes. The most bitter words of all came from the princess's brother, Earl Spencer. This is not a time for recriminations, but for sadness. However, I would say that I always believed the press would kill her in the end. But not even I could imagine that they would take such a direct hand in her death, as seems to be the case. But this evening, the dominant emotion continued to be not of anger, but of loss. Before this groundswell of emotion, the royal family hesitates. Will there be a royal funeral or not? The decision will only be announced tomorrow. But the public hasn't waited. It mourns already with a grief that is intense for the woman who has become in death what in life she had wished to be, the queen of people's hearts. Canada's gross domestic product up again in the second quarter of this year. The measure of all the goods and services produced in the country has grown by a more than 3%. But as Peter Armstrong shows us, there are signs that it's about to slow down. In a lot of ways, Canada's economy is at a crossroads. The first half of the year saw solid, even enviable rates of growth throughout the economy. Much of that came as a result of broad loosening of COVID restrictions. Canadians resumed dining out, going to shows, travel picked up, and hotels filled their rooms. Today's numbers confirm Canada posted some of the best economic growth rates in the Western world. But GDP looks back, in this case, at what was happening in April, May, and June. And by the end of June, that growth was starting to slow. 
we had a pretty strong boost coming out of Q1, which helped to support that Q2 headline number. But going into Q3, it looks like it's going to be a pretty weak print, and we're expecting that to continue going into the end of the year and into next year. Statistics Canada's preliminary estimate for GDP growth in July shows the economy probably contracted as households feel the bite of inflation eating into their purchasing power. Higher interest rates are squeezing indebted households. The Bank of Canada is using higher interest rates to tame inflation, but those rates also cool the economy. And just look down the main street of your town or neighbourhood. You don't need to be an economist to see the impact. Just about everything, everywhere, is still far more expensive than it was this time last year. Your mortgage, your car payments are up and are expected to rise through the fall. Well, Canadians are still, you know, quite eager to spend money. It's just the interests, the so-called interest-sensitive sectors, like housing, are now starting to get hit and hit hard. That's tough enough when an economy is growing. As growth slows, it poses all new challenges for consumers, businesses, and policymakers alike. Peter Armstrong, CBC News, Toronto. The U.S. Justice Department made a court filing related to the investigation of Donald Trump late last night. It says the search of his Florida estate took place because prosecutors suspected sensitive government documents had been concealed or, as Kyle Bax reports, removed in a possible attempt to obstruct the investigation. We're learning more about what was taken from Donald Trump's home earlier this month. In an overnight court filing, U.S. Department of Justice officials say FBI officers seized about 33 boxes of records, including about 100 confidential documents. This court filing also points to possible obstruction of investigation, saying government records were likely concealed and removed. There is a new photo that's included in this court filing showing documents spread out on the floor, several of them marked top secret. The court filing also casts doubt on how much cooperation authorities are receiving from Trump's representatives. A few months ago, those representatives handed over documents to authorities and said no other records that were relevant were in Trump's possession. But then this month, according to the court filing, FBI officers went to Trump's residence and recovered twice as many documents with classification markings compared to what Trump had given. It's basically, they asked for the Justice Department to punch them in the face. And that's what the Justice Department did in this, in this brief. There were documents in his office. There were documents all over the place and, do and, and tons of them. I mean, they have, if, if the, this factual recitation has him dead to rights. Trump denies any wrongdoing. Tomorrow, a federal judge will weigh in on his request to appoint a special master, which is essentially an independent third party. Trump wants a list of all the records that were seized from his property and any unrelated items to be returned. The Justice Department says a special master, if anything, will only slow down its investigation. Kyle Bax, CBC News, Washington. Well, it was 25 years ago tonight, Princess Diana died in a car crash in Paris. Her death stunned the world and united people in grief. It was a tragedy seared into the minds of the more than 2 billion viewers who later tuned in to watch her funeral. Chris Brown now on how Diana's legacy still lives on. Diana's death a quarter century ago was a seismic event for Great Britain and its monarchy. 25 years she's been gone and people still remembering her every day, like myself. I came here in 1997 when all the flowers were everywhere. Outside her former home, Kensington Palace, some fans shared a cake in her honor. Prince Diana shared things with people. We, we want the same thing. We want to share with people. Yeah. Some of these tributes are quite lengthy and also very personal, touching on her sons William and Harry. We'll watch over your sons, their wives, and your grandchildren, and your family. And this one here, your light shines through in the faces of your children and your grandchildren. There was a memorial in Paris, too, outside the tunnel where her limo slammed into a concrete pillar at high speed. Diana, who was 36, died a short time later in hospital. She made you feel like you mattered. Like Diana's legacy is especially poignant for Tessie Ojo, who administers the Diana Awards for young people who demonstrate compassion for others. I remember vividly 
watching her, for someone of color, watching her hold this little girl who I think she had AIDS or her parents had AIDS, nobody else in her position had ever happened. And for me, I was that little girl. And suddenly, you, you were visible to her. Just as Diana was notoriously mistreated by other royals, her sons, William and Harry, have fallen out over the allegedly poor treatment of Harry's wife, Meghan. People should expect the real me in this and probably the me that they've never gotten to know. Controversially, Meghan just launched her new podcast, knowing the focus would be on Diana, says this royal watcher. She is married to Prince Harry and it is part of his legacy, but I think that the timing could have been different. The soap opera over her sons and her ex-husband and future king, Charles, keeps Diana's name in the news. But people here say the example she set helping others is why her legacy endures. Chris Brown, CBC News, London. It's a city of more than 100,000 people now without running water. Why the pumps have failed and the emergency response in Mississippi next. At 6.45, a live look at downtown Vancouver tonight. On this last day of August, you'd never know that fall is just around the corner. Warm days, warm nights, but is there a cooling trend coming our way? Johanna has the answer next. Okay, you've got questions. Yeah, where are we going? Crime scene, next. Who are you? What do you do? What do you think? I'd say private detective. But? But the police don't go to private detectives. I'm a consulting detective. The only one in the world that invented the job. What does that mean? It means when the police are out of their depth, which is always, they consult me. The police don't consult amateurs. When I met you for the first time yesterday, I said Afghanistan or Iraq. You looked surprised. Yes, how did you know? I didn't know, I saw. Your haircut, the way you hold yourself, says military. But your conversation as you entered the room. A bit different from my day. Said trained at Bart, so army doctor, obvious. Your face is tanned. But no tan above the wrists. You've been abroad, but not sunbathing. Your lips really bad when you walk, but you don't ask for a chair when you stand like you've forgotten about it. So it's at least partly psychosomatic. That says the original circumstances of the injury were traumatic. Wounded in action then. Wounded in action, Suntan, Afghanistan, or Iraq. You said I had a therapist. Got a psychosomatic limp, of course, you've got a therapist. Then there's your brother. Hmm? Your phone, it's expensive, email enabled MP3 player. Are you looking for a flash? Are you going to waste money on this? It's a gift then. Scratch is not one. Many over time. It's been in the same pocket as keys and coins. Man said he next bit wouldn't treat his one luxury item like this. So it's had a previous owner. Next bit's easy, you know it already. The engraving. Harry Watson, clearly a family member who's given you his old phone. Not your father, this is a young man's gadget. Could be a cousin, but you're a war hero who can't find a place to live. Unlikely you've got an extended family, certainly not one you're close to. So, brother, it is. Now, Clara, who's Clara? Three kisses says there's a romantic attachment at expense, and the phone says wife, not girlfriend. She must have given it to him recently. This model's only six months old. Marriage in trouble then. Six months old, he's just given it away. If she'd left him, he would have kept it. People do sentiment, but no, he wanted rid of it. He left her. He gave the phone to you that says he wants you to stay in touch. You're looking for cheap accommodation, and you're not going to your brother for help. It says you've got problems with him. Maybe you liked his wife. Maybe you don't like his drinking. How can you possibly know about the drinking? Shot in the dark. Good one, though. Power connection, tiny little scuff marks around the edge of it. Every night he goes to plug it into charge, but his hands are shaking. You never see those marks on the sober man's phone, never see a drunks without them. There you go, you see, you were right. I was right. Right about what? The police don't consult amateurs.
Tonight, people in Jackson, Mississippi, are scrambling to get their hands on bottled water. The city has lost access to safe water indefinitely after its treatment facility failed. Chris Reyes looks at a system that's been in crisis for years. Until further notice, the water in Jackson, Mississippi, a city of about 150,000 people, remains unsafe to use. Right now we have um, challenges both in terms of quantity of water but also quality of water. City officials say flooding from heavy rains in recent weeks disrupted their main water plant's processing system. That means either no water or brown water out of the tap, shutting down schools and businesses. Anger from the city's residents. This is a catastrophic failure that has been, you know, in the works or in the making for quite some time. There's business to be had in this city, but without water, we're kind of, you know, we're handcuffed. We can't do anything. Yeah, it's, it's very frustrating. It's, it's very frustrating to have to fight for some water. The extreme racist politics that are being played, placing P up, politics politics before people, it has to stop. Mississippi has been dealing with a long list of problems with its water system, including sewage overfill and lead. Jackson has been under a boil water notice since July. This is a set of accumulated problems based on deferred maintenance that has not taken place over decades. Mississippi is earmarked to receive almost half a billion dollars for water improvements across the state as part of a newly passed federal infrastructure bill. The problem? Some have estimated the cost of fixing the state's crumbling water system at around $2 billion. I had a call today. I spoke uh, extensively uh, with the president, uh, and I had a separate call with the vice president. Both assured me that the eyes of Washington are watching the city of Jackson. Crews installed an emergency rental pump at the facility. The National Guard is on the ground. More bottled water supplies are set to arrive after some distribution sites ran out earlier this week. Still, that means the city doesn't have enough water to meet critical needs and a long-term solution also nowhere in sight. Chris Reyes, CBC News, New York. Meteorologist Toronto Egg staff is back now. And, you know, Joe, just a couple of minutes ago, it actually sunk in that today is the last day of August. I'm a bit shook. I, I, I don't think you're alone either. <laughs> I know it doesn't look like fall. It doesn't feel like fall. It's not fall, but we are heading into the month that it's going to happen. I'm glad you and I are both channeling summer <laughs> vibes today. Uh, so this is the last day of meteorological summer. We still get to keep on keeping on until September 22nd at 6.03 p.m. Eastern uh, Pacific time. That's officially the start to the fall equinox. But meteorologically, this is a chance at the end of August to add up the totals, so to speak. And I want to show you a look across the country at what was a warm summer. We take June 1st, August 31st as the meteorological summer and almost every station across the country. These are just a handful I've put on the map above seasonal. These might not look like big numbers. These are departures from average, and the average we're taking is 1999 to 2000. Those are our latest seasonal numbers from, from Environment and Climate Change Canada. I imagine when we get those 2010 numbers any day now, uh, we will be a lot closer to that seasonal thanks to climate change, but really just seeing some cooler temperatures over the upper Great Lakes. Everywhere else, including Vancouver, almost a full degree above a departure from normal is significant. It has been such a hot second half of the summer as we take a look at those current temperatures, especially when we compare it to what was an unseasonably cool start. Remember May, June uh, and part of July actually came in well below seasonal. So such a turn uh, mid-season. 32 right now in a Soyuz, 27 out towards Abbotsford. It's muggy as well. Uh, one of our muggiest August days, in fact, for YBR. Temperatures will come down a little bit over the next couple of days, but I don't think across Southern BC we'll really notice a drop in the temperatures until the weekend. And then it's still above seasonal by a couple of degrees, but a little more comfortable. We're talking overnights across Metro Vancouver uh, in the mid teens rather than high teens. Afternoon highs 24 to 28 rather than the 26 to 30 we're experiencing today. Notice uh, not a lot going on uh, as far as rain in the southern half, but I am still watching those lightning strikes happening right now in the interior. So we may see some new fire starts tomorrow. Uh, lots of sunshine though after this risk tonight. And as we head into the long week, Anita. Long weekend and maybe a long week, uh, still very summer-like indeed. No kidding. Well, I'm sure everyone will be soaking up these last days. Thanks, Joe. I think so. You're welcome.
Orcas up close and very, very personal. Why this pod of transients was checking on some beachgoers is next. I never thought I would have this opportunity again. Peter White is looking to correct a mistake he made in 2004. What happened was that the, the lifts required probably a couple of million dollars of capital investment. Right. And in 2004, I wasn't prepared to do that. Right. So I put it up for sale and a guy from Saint-Jean-sur-Richieu bought it, a guy called Guy Sanson. Mm -hmm. And I said, Guy, would you promise me to keep the hill open? Right. And he said, absolutely. Then, of course, he didn't. My uncle, Hank Rotherham. The Glen was first opened in 1960 by White's uncle. He took over in 1978 and says he operated it as a break-even business until he sold it 18 years ago. The mountain didn't have the biggest drops in the area, but it developed into a local favorite, with many people learning to ski on its slopes. Though there hasn't been many new ski hills to open in Quebec in recent years. When the Glen closed in 2004, there were 82. Today, there are only 73. And the number of people skiing or snowboarding is down slightly, too. The year that the Glen closed, participation was at a 20-year high. In the eastern townships, however, the number of people on hills is about even to what it was 18 years ago. I certainly am not in this to make money. You know, in the ski business, the way to become a millionaire is to start with a billion. Still, White recently put in an offer to repurchase the land. It was accepted and he's set to take ownership this fall. So what's changed is this. People are very, very interested in what they call alpine touring. Right. Going up the mountain on skins yep. under your cross-country skis yep. and then skiing down on groomed trails. And that's exactly what we can offer here. White says he plans to add lifts within a couple of years. The old ones are no longer operational. He says the mountain will not try to compete with the likes of nearby Owl's Head or Bromont. He plans to keep its rustic feel. When you have 300, 400 cars that go there on a Saturday, Sunday, and during the, uh, the uh, holiday, the Christmas break, and you have 75 that stop in Knowlton on the way back, or on the way going, buying gas or whatever, or going to the restaurants or the stores. I mean, it's great. It was great for the economy. The economy. It was so devastating to the community when it closed, economically and socially and everything, that it'll never be allowed to close again. That's my view. Right, we'll, we'll try and get that exact same photo again this coming spring. <laughs> Douglas Gallivan, CBC News, West Bolton. We've actually seen plenty of orca sightings this year, but this one is a little different. Take a look. Oh my God! Oh my God! <laughs> this is amazing! Oh my God! Ah! You know, if I were that swimmer, I think I uh, might move out of the water too. These big orcas were spotted off of Quadra Island this past weekend. The swimmers were actually free diving and spear fishing on the island. They saw them earlier, but they were further out in the ocean, giving them a bit of a look-see. But the orca curiosity didn't end out in the deep ocean. They actually came into the bay where we were and came right up to the, the edge of the water. I didn't think they were going to come that close. They definitely seemed very curious. Um, they definitely wanted to check us out, that's for sure. When Callum was in the water, they wanted to see what he was doing. 
they, yeah, they were probably about two to three feet, like away from Callum. And then me and Erica were standing up higher on kind of a like little cliff. And then they swung around to us and like went sideways into the water and like stuck their eyes out up towards us to check us out as well. Jump away for sure. That is definitely too close for comfort. Now, I say they are pretty darn cute though, but there is a little bit of debate in the newsroom today around whether orcas should be called cute. So I'll leave that with you to think about tonight. Thanks for watching CBC Vancouver News. That is our show and we'll see you back here tomorrow.